Hello everyone, this is Al Fadi and I want to welcome you back to this exciting new series. And obviously all we're trying to do here is to compare and contrast between the standard Islamic narrative concerning Mecca and what are the facts actually revealing to us. So we will now begin to examine those contradictions between facts and the standard narrative. And today we will start with one of the many series of these problems we can, we're going to call today's episode the problem with sources. So with me here, of course, is Dr. J to unpack that for us. Yeah, now we're getting into the historical difficulty. Now you might say, hold on a minute, haven't you already, haven't you already started? Yes, we have. And in the previous episodes, we did get in some historical uh, anachronisms that are difficult and need to be addressed. What I want to do now is look at more specific problems because this is the difficulty that Mecca has. The, it makes so many claims. You saw the claims it makes that it's the earliest city. It's the city that Abraham went to. It's a city that all these prophets, whole litany of prophets, up to 300 prophets are buried at. Therefore, it's the center of history. It is not only the center, it is history. Because all the prophets from Adam all the way up until, uh, up, up until today, well, Muhammad's not born uh, buried there. He's born, buried in Medina. But all the other prophets are buried there. Uh, then th all of history is centered on Mecca. It's great to be able to lift Mecca up so high, but the higher you lift it, the more you put up on a higher pedestal, the farther he's going to fall. And now we're going to start watching that fall. Because because of the claims they made, they have, in, in many ways, they have just destroyed themselves historically. So let's go into the historical problems and let's ask the first question. And of course, there it is right on the screen. Everything is too late and too distant. This is not something uh, that we're just bringing out, taking out of the hat. We've talked about this many times before. Right. So in some ways, this is review. Let's go ahead and let's look and see what we're talking about. Now, I want to look, show this timeline because timelines really help people. Uh, it's one thing to say it and you start hearing all these in the dates, 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 but you're not really putting it into place. So I want people to look at this timeline. Let's go to the slide. Let's start then with the emergence. This is how uh, the Islamic uh, standard narrative, the standard Islamic narrative has always said, and this is what they tell us. They tell us that Muhammad is born Born, was born in 570. That they, I don't say that, they say that, okay? And that we know that the Quran was first revealed in 610. So you're talking about right. 40 years into his life, he starts to receive this Quran from Jibril there in Mecca. So he's been in Mecca since 570, he's still in Mecca, 610, 40 years later, and he's up in the cave, the Hida cave, and he starts receiving this revelation. Now, what we do know is that the, uh, about 621, 10, 11 years later, suddenly he's woken up in the middle of the night, told to get on the back of the winged horse, who flies him up to Jerusalem, and from Jerusalem he then goes up to the seven heavens. That's mm -hmm. called the Miraj. How do you say it? Miraj. 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 Yeah. I'm not going to even try to desecrate your language. You do such a good job of doing it correctly. Uh, please st stop me and correct me every time we get to these words. That happens in 621. The next year then he moves to Medina. Why? Well, because he's been invited to do so, because they're having problems between the Ansar and the Jews. They need someone who's neutral. They've heard about the great this great man who has a lot of wisdom down there in Mecca, and they asked him to come and arbitrate because he's already having a hard time with the, those uh, in Mecca. He's having a terrible time with all the other people who do not like the revelations he's receiving. So he moves up, some say with maybe 80, some say with maybe 200 followers, known as the Mahajurun. These are the people of the Hijr, these are the people of the Exodus, the people of the movement from one place to another. And that happens in 622. This is the standard Islamic narrative. Again, That's we keep right. repeating that. This is their narrative. He comes back to Mecca and then takes over Mecca in 630, and then he dies in 632. So that is the life of Muhammad, the life of Muhammad right there, okay? According to the standard narrative. According to the standard Islamic narrative. Right. There you can see it on a timeline, from 570 up to 630. That is his lifetime. Now, what happens as soon as he dies? Well, then Abu Bakr takes in control, and then he rules for about two years, and he dies naturally. All right? 632 to 634. So someone else has to take over. Umar comes in and takes over, and he is around from 634 to 644, so he's there for another 10 years. There he is right there, okay? Right. That's Umar. He is killed. He is killed. Right. So when he is killed, Uthman has to come and take over. Boom, 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 bounces back in here. There's Uthman. Now, while he is in power between 644 and 656, the Quran then is finalized, is canonized, is compiled yes. in its final form. Right. There's 652. That's why I have it on the timeline there. 
So we're talking about, a, a, roughly, we're talking about 20 years after Muhammad's death here in 632. You then finally get his final compilation in 652. He is killed as well. Like Umar, he is killed. And so Ali takes over. And Ali rules for just five years from 50, 656 up to 661. He is killed as well. So of these rightly guided caliphs, three of them are killed. Once that finishes in 661, that is the end of what we know as the Rashidun period, the time of the rightly guided caliphs. So from basically from this period up to this period, this period up to this period, 40 year from six, let's say 624 when the caliphate was introduced up till 661. 40 years is the golden era. This is everything the standard Islamic narrative has told us. And what we're told is that Muhammad lived in Mecca up until 622, then he moved to Medina, and then Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali all ruled from Medina. So that's the Hijaz. This is the standard Islamic narrative. Look at it on a timeline. Right. Can you see then there's going to be some problems with this? Because if this is the case, by the time Ali comes into power, and by the time he dies, and Mu'awiyah takes over the beginning of the Umayyad Caliphate in 661, then you have, by that time, they now have control all the way from uh, almost Libya in the west to over here, uh, Afghanistan in the east. That whole swath. I'll put up a map just a bit. Hold on a minute but let, mm -hmm. before we get on it. Now, I, 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 I want to say that's a great story. You've heard it. I've heard it. You've grown up with it. I've grown up with it. That's the only story we've ever heard. That's the narrative that everybody's told us. But hold on. Where does that come from? Let's put this timeline up again. So we got a new timeline. This is the the Islamic uh, uh, the standard Islamic narrative. Where do they get all this story about Muhammad? Well, he dies in 632, right? Is that the time this story is put together? Mm, You'd like I mean, to think so, right? I mean, that's what you would expect, but uh, that's not the case. Okay, you're gonna you, you know the answer to this, and I know you don't want to say it right now because right. we want to look at the timeline again. That's so right. we would hope that the death of Muhammad, there was someone there who saw him die, or there was someone there who was around to write down what had happened when he died. That's there was right. someone there who would write the story down, right? That's correct. I mean, at least that's what biographies are all about. At least you ta you write something as an eyewitness. Maybe somebody later will improvise if you wish, but at least you start with an eyewitness account. When Jesus died, was there anybody there to notice that he died? All of the apostles. All of who's standing at the foot of the cross? John, John was at the foot of the cross. Exactly. Did not John write about his death and resurrection? Absolutely. He was an eyewitness to that account. Absolutely. Matthew, Mark, Luke didn't. Okay, he got it from the others, but certainly Matthew, Mark, and the other disciples, they were either at the foot of the cross or they were far away looking at it from a distance, but they were all there yeah. when Jesus but died. But even Luke, he said he consulted existing already. Uh, biographies uh, of, of Christ's Gospels, and he also interviewed eyewitness account. So we have eyewitness account of Jesus' death right. and of his ministry. Certainly Matthew and John were with him for the last three years, so they knew right. everything he said, everything he did, they were right there, they were privy to everything they saw and everything right. they heard, right? That's what we would expect of Sir Muhammad, because we're talking about 2,000 years ago, now we're only talking about 1,400 years ago, 632, who was there? Well, we know that nothing was written down right after his death. Uh, we have the Sirah of the biography. This is the first time we read, read about him. This guy here, Ibn Ishaq, look at his date, 765. Muhammad dies in 632. 765. We're talking about 130 years later. Yeah, you can't tell me that somebody lived that long. It's just impossible. <laughs> Everybody would have talked about that person. That's right. You yeah. know good and well that he was not there at Muhammad's death. He was not there to know Muhammad. He's writing a biography that's 130 years later. But hold on a minute, hold on, hold on a minute. We don't have Ibn Ishaq, do we? No, because we, we go to Ibn, Ibn Ishaq. We go to this guy here. Ibn Isham. Ibn Isham. We go to this guy here. Take a look at this. Look at his dates, 833. We have nothing from Ibn Ishaq at all. That's why I put him in light yellow. I put him in light green. So let's get rid of him, okay? Bingo. Let's just get rid of him. Why? Because we don't have him. Right. Throw him out. And let's go to Ibn Isham. So Ibn Isham is the first to write down the Sirah, the Sirah to Rasulullah, which would be the biography of Muhammad. He writes and dies in 833. There's one other that comes after him, that's Al-Wakiri. So Al-Wakiri would be the other yeah. one that comes after him. Right. So there you have those two. But it's not just the biography we want to talk about. We also want to talk about the sayings of Muhammad. These are the more important. These are the what that tells you, how, tells you how to walk, talk, eat, drink, sleep 24-7. You need to know what you need to do as a Muslim. You need to go to the Hadith. So who is the first one to write down the Hadith? Let's put his we'll put up the timeline again. And there's the sayings and we have to go to Al-Buhari, 870. So he's way over here writing down for what Muhammad said way back there. Right. I mean, I want just people to look at this. What we're telling you is this, according to the standard Islamic narrative, the primary sources that will tell you about Muhammad 
or what he said or how he lived, how he behaved, are at least 200 years and more beyond his life. Okay, exactly. Yeah. He's not the yeah. only one. We have some right. other ones. Let's look yeah. at these ones. Sahih Muslim. Take a look at Sahih Muslim there. Right. 875. Let's look at some other ones. Here you have at the Mirdi. Oh, sorry. 884. Here's another one. Ibn Majah. You, you go ahead and say the name. Yeah. Look at, and I'll do the date. 887. Abu, uh, Abu Dawood. 899. Right. And Nisa'i. 915. These are the six major compilations of the Hadith. These are the most authoritative according ones. According to the Sunni, of According course, to the standard Islamic narrative, right. these are the ones you have to go to to understand what Muhammad said. These six. The first is Al-Buhari 870. I want to, everybody to visualize this, 870. But we still have two more genres of the standard Islamic narrative, the Islamic traditions that we need to go to. And that would be the Tafsir and the Tahrik. I have them in brown because they are a different genre. Uh, and who is the one, the first to write that down? The first guy to come up with that material is Al-Tabri, 923. Mm -hmm. 923, look at that. Everything that's, that, that you hear about the Tafsir, like Badawi, Zamakshari, Suyuti, and all these others, they come after 923. And the Tahrik, the histories, they come after 923. He is the first to write this down. Now, why is that important? Well, let's look at the dates. Look at the years. Can you see I've got it right there? Right, yeah. So people can see it uh, right there also. 201 years between Muhammad's death and the time that Ibn Hisham writes about that death. I mean, people can ask yourself, can you truly believe there was an eyewitness that survived that long? So, before we even do that, we need to talk about where this was introduced. Now, we already talked about the 201 years that are up there. Right. What's the first time we hear Muhammad's name introduced? Well, this is the guy that we need to go to. Uh, we've said this many times, you have denied before, and his name is Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik, the caliph between 685 and 705, is the first one to introduce his name. He introduces it on the coins, he introduces it on the Dome of the Rock, and he introduces it on the caliphal protocols. Right. The coins and the protocols are all being created there in Medina. Of course, the Dome of the Rock is in Jerusalem. So it's been introduced in 692. If in 692, take a look at the, the timeline again, and you see that's 141 years after Abdul Malik even introduces the name that finally we hear about who he is and mm -hmm. what he did, right? Right. But I, I, you know, Abdul Malik, we don't have anything written from Abdul Malik's age. We need to go back and find out who is the one that actually introduces the narrative about him. And the people who introduce the narrative about him are the Abbasids. We've said this many times. It's the Abbasid narrative. The standard Islamic narrative is really the standard Abbasid narrative. That's when everything uh, uh, basically was uh, being put together. That that's when it all is put together, and that's their narrative. They've had 84 years before they finally get it written down. They come into power in 749. It's not till 833 that they finally get his biography down. It's not till the 870. That is 120 years later that they finally get his sayings. 70 years and, I mean, 80 years and 120 years? What does that tell you? What's going on here? I mean, everything is late, like you said. And why is it so late? Because that's how long it takes for them to finally agree on getting it put together. Remember what we've heard about Al-Buhari. Al-Buhari is given 600,000 of these akhbars, that's right. these sayings. And he looks at them and he whittles them down. Throwing out, throwing out, throwing out, throwing And he comes down to 7,397, basically 7,400. Out of 600,000, he whittles them down to only 7,397. That's just 2%. Right. And 98% he throws out. Well, what and where did that 98% come from? And the reason why he threw them out? Because of corruption. They didn't. He says corruption. Yeah, invention, you know. Yeah. We now know it didn't fit their narrative. It did not yeah. fit the Abbasid narrative. And that other 98% was all from before the Abbasid. So that's the material that we can't find. That's the material that predates 749. All that material that goes from 749 all the way back to 632, that first 120 years, that material we don't have because it's all been destroyed by people like Al-Buhari and others. They themselves admit that they destroyed it. Throwing out 98%, I'd love to see that 98%. Because if we could see that 98%, we could then really know whether or not Muhammad did exist, whether or not the Quran did was revealed at that point, and most importantly for our discussion, whether or not Mecca ever existed that early. 
as we're going to find out, if this is what we're working with, this kind of timeline, can you then understand then why we're, we're bringing up this problem? Now, let's before we go on, let's look, and I want to go back to the screen again. I want to show you this map. Look at this map here. This is what we know is concerning the distance and direction, because everything we know about the Muhammad from the standard Islamic narrative comes from those two cities right there, the Mecca and Medina that you see circled in green. Everything that they say happened uh, with uh, Muhammad and everything else that happened with the emergence of Islam, the origin of Islam, all comes from those two cities that you see right here, Mecca and Medina, right in that part of the world. That's the central part of right. Arabia, right? right? It's not the north, it's not the south, it's not the east. Not the north, not the south, not the east. As we said in the last episode, that's where the big empires existed. There's nothing happening here because this is all desert. Nonetheless, the standard Islamic narrative is saying that these cities existed from the time immemorial, from the time of Adam and Eve, from the time of Abraham, and we're all in charge of all the trade, north, south, east, and west. So we're going to zero in on that. Here's the difficulty. The story from the, all the standard Islamic narrative comes from writers. But they're all writing in this city up here, Baghdad. Baghdad is 1,800 kilometers away from Mecca and Medina. It's way too far north. That's right. It gets even worse than that. Geographically speaking, it's uh, further away from uh, the supposed epic center of Islam. We talked about Ibn Isham, the first to write down the Siddha. He was born in Basra, right? Mm -hmm. Born in Basra. But he grew up in Cairo, which is over here. So he grew up in Cairo. And then he did all his work up in Baghdad. So Cairo is 1,600 kilometers north. Basra is 1,800 kilometers north. Baghdad is 1,800 kilometers as well. Can you then understand why suddenly everything that we know about the standard Islamic narrative, where it's been put together, where it's been compiled, is thousands of kilometers away? And Baghdad was the capital for the Abbasid uh, dynasty. That Baghdad was a capital and it became the capital in the mid 8th century. Before that, it was called Stesiphon. Stesiphon yeah, yeah. is the. Astaphon, yeah. and, and then they. Is the Persian name. Yes, exactly. For what used to be the Persian from the Abbas, I'm sorry, right. the Sassanian uh, the times. So yeah. that's just for the Siddha. Let's go to Al Buhari. He's called Al Buhari because he comes from Buhara. That is that's Uzbekistan. Right. That's right. That is Uzbekistan. How far is that from Mecca and Medina? That's a good 4,200. That's, that is thousands of kilometers away. That's where he grew up. That's where he did his work, but that's where he grew up. He was nowhere near Mecca and Medina when he either he grew up or when he did his work. Uh, let's do the, uh, the Tafsir and the Tahrik, and that's from Al Tabari. Look at where Al Tabari he grew that's up right. here in Tabaristan, which is today Iran. That's right. So Iran, Uzbekistan, Iraq, Egypt. Notice what you see with those red dots. What a coincidence. Tabaristan is 2,800 miles away. Conclusion, none of the traditional writers lived or worked in Mecca or Medina. They were too far to the north of Mecca and came from the west and east of Baghdad. What more that? All of these northern areas, everything you see here on this map up here, are where the Abbasids originated from. Let's do one other thing. I want to look at this problem with this northern hegemony. So let's look at the next map. This northern hegemony, when you look at the Islamic traditions, so the Islamic traditions say it all happened in the Hijaz, yet all the writers of the traditions work in Baghdad. You can see that, and, and they come from, uh, they work in Baghdad, though they come from these other cities, so I'm putting them up on the map there. You can see visually. Note all of these northern areas are where the Abbasids originated from, where all the red circles are. That's where they originated from. On top of that, all the writers of the traditions, let's come down underneath here, look where the writers are. There's Ibn Isham, mm -hmm. there's Al-Buhari, there's Al-Tabari, they're I'm saying, hundreds of years away for the, uh, for the writers. Which is even more and damaging. There yeah. you go, yeah. and hundreds of miles too far to the north. So that when we always say too far north and too far distant, or too far north and too, too late, too late and too far, this is what we're talking about. That's too late down here, and that's too far up there. It's too late because Muhammad was born way back there, and it's too far north because Muhammad was not born, or Muhammad supposedly was born here when everything we know about him is way up here. So, conclusion, they all wrote their material hundreds of miles too far away and hundreds of years too late. There's the timeline, right. there's the map, the two together. So we're put, uh, concluding with all these things. Not, not, hold on a minute, people say, well, hold on a minute, you've got the same problem in Christianity. Do we? Let's do the same timeline and let's look at Christianity and let's look at Jesus Christ. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you where our writers 
write about Jesus Christ. And I'm going to give the most liberal dates possible. You're not going to agree with these dates. You're going to get all upset. Don't worry about it. I want to show you with even the most liberal dates. For those of you who are watching me, you're, many of you are going to get upset. You Christians, hold on, hold on. I'm doing this intentionally. I want to take not the conservative dates. I want to take the liberal dates. Let's look and see what we know about Jesus. And let's ask the same question about Jesus when he was born, who wrote it, when they lived it, when they wrote about what he said and did. So let's start with it. There is Jesus in 33 AD. Now, the, the Tahrik is the first to be written down. So this would be the history of, of mm -hmm. the early church. And that's the book of Acts, the, the history of the early yeah. church. Um, now, we know that that was written to, uh, by Luke between 52 and 62 AD. So we're talking roughly 20 to 30 years after Christ died, you have the, the Tahrik. 50, uh, I think you're referring to the history book, basically. Right? History of the early church would be the yeah. it would be. Yeah. That's why I have it in brown because I'm right. trying to do like with like. Oh, the so I'm trying of the church, uh, basically, is represented by the Book of Acts. And the Tahrik of Tabari would be the the, uh, the equivalent to the Tahrik of, of yeah. the of Tabari New Testament. Versus tarikh, uh, okay. Uh, Rasul. Yeah. Now let's look at the Tafsir. So the Tafsir would be the commentaries of Paul. Mm -hmm. Paul begins to write within 15 years of Christ's death and then continues up until 65 AD. So that's within 15 to 34 years of Christ, you have the Tafsir. The Tafsir of Al-Tabari would be corresponding to the Tafsir of Paul. Paul is the one who then unpacks what Jesus said in all of his letters in the different cities. Uh, then we get to what Jesus actually did. Well, then you need to start with Mark. Let's start with Mark and let's put him at 70 AD. I know some people are going to get upset with me. I'm looking at the most liberal dates. Mm -hmm. 70 AD is when the Siddha, which would be the biography of Jesus' life in the Hadith, which would be the sayings of Jesus, were first written down by Mark. That's within 37 years of Jesus' death. And then you have Matthew and Luke, which would be the other two Gospels, written around 80 AD. So that's the Siddha and the Hadith. Now, so we have three Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke, written within 37 to 47 years of mm -hmm. Christ's death. And then finally, we have the Gospel of John, which would be the last Siddha and the last Hadith, written about 90 AD. So within 57 years of Christ's Again, death. Again, I mean, some, some might jump in right now and watch this, and I know we're going to get a lot of hate mail, hate comments, we're giving you the most liberal dates out there just to make our point clear. That's what we're doing. We're Go trying ahead. to show you. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I don't agree with these dates necessarily, but they're all before yeah. 90 AD, That's okay? Right. If right. we can all agree on that, they're all before 90 AD. And they Christ see the conservative in dates AD. in the brackets. They can see them. You know? Okay. Yeah. So, within 29 to 57 years of Christ's death, we get the entire New Testament written down. All right. Within 30 to 60 years, let's just say roughly 30 to 60 years, we get the entire New Testament written down. Note and take note of this. All of the New Testament writers, whether it is Luke or Paul or Mark or Matthew or John, all of them were writing in the same place Jesus lived. That's right. I mean, uh, that's the main point. They were eyewitness, basically, to what he has done. Peter makes that case in 2 Peter chapter 1, starting from verse 16. They're not writing hundreds of miles away. That's right. See, if they were writing hundreds of miles away, in comparison to what we now know about the writers who wrote about Muhammad's life and what he said, they would have to be living way up in Turkey. None of them lived way up in Turkey. They lived in Palestine. They lived where Jesus lived. They actually were in the same towns, the same cities. They were with him for three years. Uh, at least two of them were, okay? That's the first thing. They either knew him personally or they got the material from others who saw what he did and heard. And they were all writing their material down within 30 to 60 years of Christ's death. Mm -hmm. Now, can you then understand why the scholars have such a problem with the traditions of Muhammad? Because everything they say concerning Islam's late date, everything they know about Islam, everything they know about Mecca, did not exist in the seventh century at all, but evolved over a period of two to three hundred years. The Quran, the book that Muhammad supposedly was revealed to, uh, was not written in 22 years like the standard Islamic narrative wants to tell us, but likely evolved over a period of 50 to 100 years. The conclusion is the history of Islam and the city of Mecca at least from the time of the Caliph Abdul Malik and before is a later fabrication. And that's why, look at their concerns. I'll just put it up there just for you to see. Look at their concerns. Why in the world did it take so long to write this down? Why is it nobody took about, why is it no one actually lived in Mecca to write about it in Mecca? That's right. Where, and Muslims always say, well, because they were not literate. No, come on. All the way from over in the West Libya to uh, Afghanistan in the East, by the time the Mu'awiyah Mu and the Umayyads come into power, from the first Riley guided Kedos 
that includes uh, Muhammad, that includes Abu Bakr, Uman, Uthman, and Ali. You're yeah. saying that nobody actually lived in that area or that could read or write? No one could read or write in any of that area? Amen. And, and how, how come none of these writers says, well, I went down to Mecca and Medina and I interviewed so-and-so and I interviewed so-and-so. You don't read something like that. You see nothing like that. Yeah. You can see why, because they lived two to three hundred years right. too late. So, obviously, where did the where did these biographies, where did they get the material from? And should we even entrust it if it's two to three hundred miles? Should we not go back to the same time period? Should we not go back to Mecca? Should we not go back to the seventh century? And we do. We need to go back to the seventh century. We need to go back to Mecca. And let's see what they're finding. And that's what we need to talk about. So we're not interested. Folks, everybody listen to me. I'm not going to say it too, too many more times. We're not interested in the 9th and 10th century. We're interested in the 7th century. We want to go back to the century that Muhammad actually lived. We want to go back to the place that he lived in in Mecca. We need to go back to Mecca in the 7th century, not in what the 9th and 10th century have redacted back. That's what we're going to be doing next. So, obviously, the next thing we're going to look at is, and before we do that, let me just quickly put up this map. Let me just put this map just to end this off. Take a look at this map. Let's look at the slide here. This is the map that we need to look at because when you look at this map here, you can see, and if you just, uh, if we look at the side, if you look at the brown area, if you could put, show me, uh, look at me, point at this brown area here, that's the part of, according to what the standard Islamic narrative said, existed by the time Muhammad died. Right, so right which in that brown is, area. Which is the Hijaz region with a smaller portion of the Najd region, basically. And, and coming down here to the Hadramat. All Hadamat. the way to Yemen, yeah, and then, Hadramat. By the time we get to the time of Uthman and Ali, then you get this this orange area here. Right. But by the time we get to... Oh my I'm yes. sorry, Ali. So uh, Uthman Ali, you get to this period. So from this place, which is Afghanistan, all the way over to Tripoli, by the time Mu'awiyah comes to power, this whole swath of land is now under the control. And this is the area that I want to talk about. So I want to talk about the pink, the orange, and the brown area, those three areas. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this area because this they controlled. They controlled all of that area. And that includes Afghanistan, that includes Iran today, Afghanistan today, Iran, that includes Iraq, today's Iraq, that includes Jordan, that includes Syria, that includes Lebanon, that includes Israel, that includes all of Saudi Arabia, and that includes Egypt and, and, and Libya. So that whole swath of land was there under the control by the time that Muyawiya comes to power in 661. Meaning that we need to go back to this map, to this area, and to that time. That's what we're going to do next. Wonderful. I hope everyone is enjoying this series. And uh, as you heard, when we come back, we will begin to visit these areas. And we will talk also about the Arabic language uh, and also its implication when it comes to the Quran, among many other issues that we will be raising. Hopefully... Uh, you can join us back again and thank you for your interactions and your comments. Keep them coming. And if you uh, um, are a Muslim, uh, basically, we are so thankful, of course, that you're making time to watch this. Please do not have a, an emotional response to this. We, we're asking you just to take the information, do your own research, and then come back to us with your questions and we'll be more than happy to address them if they're indeed sincerely asked about this issue and verifications related to that. Thank you, brother. Thank you, everyone. This is Al-Fadi. Over and out. God bless you. Thank you.